Hi, I'm Tara Sinclair, Chief Economist of Indeed. I'm here in Seattle, Washington today to speak with Susan Harker, Amazon's Vice President of Global Talent Acquisition. Susan, it is so great to be able to talk with you today. Uh, you know, obviously, uh, Amazon has been very successful in attracting tech talent, and uh, so I'd, I'd love to start out just by asking you, first of all, what Amazon's philosophy is in terms of hiring and mm -hmm. in, in terms of being able to attract that top tech talent. You know, I think um, I, I, it's a technology company, so you know that it has some attraction in and of itself. Um, but also, the thing that I hear the most often from our interns or when people first get here that, that maybe it was a little unexpected for them is that they get a lot of ownership over what they're doing. They, they, they have a broader scope to their initial roles um, than they have experienced elsewhere. And so I think that's what you know, our primary attraction is, for, is they get to work on very hard, challenging problems, but they get a lot of ownership. They're not working on just one little piece um, of code in a much, much broader, they, they get to work more end to end, and, and they really like that. So it's, um, you know, I think it's, it's the right place for people who want to learn a lot, be challenged, you know, all the time, um, and have a lot of really thorny, hard problems to solve, because those are the ones that are pioneering and groundbreaking for customers. So how do you communicate that to a new potential mm -hmm. recruit? You know, I think that's the, um, I, I think we need to get better and better at it because honestly you, you experience that when you come here as an intern or as an employee. It's a harder thing to portray, you know, in sound bites. Um, so I, I think it's having them talk to alumnus, um, you know, helping utilize a network of people who have done internships um, at the company or have worked at the company or do work at the company. Um, and, and really hearing what people's true experiences are working here is, is the best way to do it. Um, and we're doing some things from um, an employer branding perspective in terms of putting out, um, we, we have a campaign right now called Beyond the Badge. And it's people just doing short clips of interviews about their work experience at Amazon. So it's just very authentic, you know, here's, Here's how my take on it, and, um, and I, I think the best employer brand, if you will, is what people's actual experience is. I'd like to transition a little bit into some of the insights that we're seeing in our data and, and trying to get your, right. your response to that. It, one of the key things we wanted to look at in this report is the role of location in mm -hmm. uh, both you know, from, from the employer perspective as well as from the job seeker perspective. And you know, one thing we were really kind of expecting to see is we, you know, we know that tech needs are just expanding mm -hmm. to you know, all over the country, all over the globe, and to all different sorts of companies. Mm -hmm. and so so your competition isn't just other employers here in Seattle, it's you know, throughout the country in all That's different right. sorts and, and, and types of opportunities. Uh, but one thing that really struck me in, in our data when I was looking at this is that job seekers are still very you know, locally focused on a few main cities, um, and particularly here in the US. Um, now, of course, Seattle is one of them. Um, are you guys seeing a similar pattern in terms of difficulty in attracting talent outside of Seattle, or do you take advantage particularly of being here in Seattle? Both. Um, you know, I think a lot of people, uh, it's very hard to get people out of the Bay Area if you're graduating mm -hmm. from um, Cal school and, mm -hmm. uh, or you're living and working in the Bay Area. Um, you know, that's kind of, uh, it's like being a, going into investment banking but not going to New York. So, right. the, you know, the Bay Area is a very big pull. Um, so location is always an issue. I mean, location, if you look at sort of the people who declined offers, very frequently for almost any company, no matter where you are, location is going to be an issue um, if someone has to move. And so I think Seattle has become a lot more attractive of a location for people because not only you know the, with the growth of Amazon, but we have Microsoft. And um, you know I, I get asked a lot with having companies like Facebook and Google and, and Alibaba coming in. You know, is that a bad thing? I think it's a good thing because I think it's making us more of a tech center that makes it a lot easier to attract people to Seattle. Mm -hmm. um, and the, the, the thing about Seattle is once they come here, they don't want to leave because it's just, it's a great quality of life. But um, location is definitely a factor. And if you um, really want to be in Boston or you really want to be in the Bay Area, um, you know, we do have opportunities for technical talent in both those locations and in a number of locations. And I think we have to view 
technical talent is a global talent pool. Right. But you know, there's a lot of constraints to that talent pool. The H-1B visa cap is the biggest constraint. There's also people who just, you know, they want to have that experience in the Bay Area, or they don't want to leave New York, or they, don't, and so, you, you know, loco location is definitely going to be a factor for any candidate who has to make a move. But I do think that, you know, we're not asking them to move to a location just not known for tech. I mean, Seattle's pretty well known for tech talent. Right. It was actually one of the reasons um, that that Jeff picked Seattle to to um, have be Amazon's headquarters because it was a good location for technical talent as well as. Um, uh, transportation and, and other um, variables that made a lot of sense for launching a company like Amazon. It, thinking globally in, in terms of you know, outside the U.S., what are some key locations you're, you're seeing um, are other agglomerations of, of tech talent? Well, there, there's one of the things we're doing is studying what types of tech talent are clustered where. Mm -hmm. And so, um, you know, we've done a fair amount of research on that. and. Um, what we're trying to do more and more is strategically site locations where there already are clusters of talent. So um, being thoughtful and more strategic about where we place a site and where there are clusters of talent and there's an opportunity there and generally there's, there's a good education system and, and university system that can feed that talent. Um, the, the, the problem with having just a whole lot of scattered sites is um, if you don't reach critical mass in a location, it's harder to have new and different opportunities or experiences. So, you know, rather than just try to spread everywhere, we try to be very thoughtful about where can we build a location that's going to give a lot of opportunity for people to have different experiences and career advancement without being forced to come to headquarters. You know, one thing we've also seen in, in our data is that you know, even though you know, we do see clusters of talent and oftentimes, like you said, with Seattle, with the Bay Area, once they get there, they don't want to leave and, and there, there is that evidence. But we also see that there are certain areas globally as, as well as within the U.S. where it, job seekers are very keen to move to those areas. And so the tech talent actually looks bigger than the numbers you see if you just look at current populations there, mm -hmm. and we actually want to explore beyond and look at who's looking to move in those cities. Mm -hmm. uh, but it, it does look like there is that, that pattern that, that you're talking about where we're just seeing a lot of, of clustering uh, around a set of skills. Um, and we're kind of thinking that perhaps it's, it is more than just other job opportunities in the area. That seems to be part of the driver. But then it seems like once we get a critical mass of people, mm -hmm. that there's also, they, they have other overlapping interests that they see kind of filling in in those uh, cities where. Where are the ones you see people most uh, uh, excited about migrating to? Well, so uh, there's, we, we split up into two different bits. We looked at the US and then we looked globally. Mm -hmm. um, and, and really, the, the one globally that is both a surprise and not at all a surprise is London. Mm -hmm. um, you know, we tend to think of London as a finance hub, but they've done a great job of tying that in with tech. Mm -hmm. And it's well beyond just about population anymore, right? It, it, they're a big city, so there's going to be lots of opportunities there. But even if we control for population, there's still lots of tech interest in London. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, and then you think about it, you know, going back to the H-1B visa issue, you know, London can pull from the entire EU, EU. Uh, which, which gives them you know, additional options mm -hmm. for attracting talent, mm -hmm. um, whereas you know, we you know, each year quickly run into challenges with mm -hmm. that here in the U.S. Although you know, we, we've seen from previous reports and we're seeing it again when we looked at the data this time that still tech talent wants to be in the U.S. and they want to be in a few key, key areas. They want to be in the Bay Area mm -hmm. um, and then less so um, you know, Seattle and Austin are the other. One other thing that we're really seeing from a lot of job seekers is that they're interested in remote and work from home options. And on the other hand, when I've spoken with other employers, it can sometimes be a challenge because you do want those you know, collisions between you know, different people to come up with new creative ideas. Are, are you working in that area at all, trying to balance the, the benefits of having them together versus allowing job seekers the flexibility to work from home or have a remote position? You know, I think um, there, it depends on where you are in the cycle because there's t if you're doing scrums together, y you can't be remote. Mm -hmm. um, so I think there, you know, there, are, there are types of work that absolutely can be done from home. Um, I, but I think 
for, for what I hear more is it's less about I want to be at home and it's more about I want some flexibility. And I think flexibility is important. And so I think you know, you, there needs to be, um, you know, managers need to have the judgment to be clear about what, what work can be done and makes sense to be done from home and when people need to be working together, like doing scrum and, and, and things like that. There's a lot of um, team dynamic in development and being able to um, be part of the brainstorming. Um, you're a team participant in a scrum. You're, it, it is very important. Um, on the other hand, if you're doing a solo task that requires a lot of concentration, um, why not do that from home? Um, so I think different people have different views on that. Some people feel very strongly you got to be together as a team and some people um, feel less strongly about that. But I, I, what I hear more often is just having some flexibility unless I just want to work from home all the time. Mm -hmm. No, that's exactly what we're seeing in our data as well, is that there, it's, you know, these are often proxies for flexibility, flexibility generally. Right. And that does seem to be something that particularly for talent that is in demand, you have to think about ways to attract them to your positions as compared to other positions. Right. Flexibility seems to be it. You know, if we talk salary, obviously, but beyond that, location and flexibility seem to be the other two that really matter. Well, those are things that are fairly, um, I think, common denominators. But what I find for technical people matters more than anything is the nature of the work and the challenge, the types of problems that they get to work on the impact that they can have, the customers that they can touch. When I talk to developers, and I talk to lots of developers all the time, um, that's what they care about. So um, I, I think those other things are important attributes when you're considering competitive offers, but I think that that, that impact, that type of challenge is, um, the, that they get to work on is, is really the most important thing for them. We've already talked a little bit about this, um, but in terms of creative strategies, you know, mm -hmm. tech talents, it's been in demand. It, it was mm -hmm. a challenge to hire them even when the unemployment rate in the U.S. was That's right. really high. That's right. Uh, so now it's going to get even harder. You know, I think th th there's, as you pointed out, e even when we were in recession, there was still demand for this talent and competition for this talent. And, you know, we, we don't have enough of this talent to meet demand. So um, it's, it's going to be competitive. And unfortunately, I don't see that changing in the near term, hopefully in the long term. Um, but so it, it, it is what you really have to appeal to what they want to do. And I think one of the, um, there's gimmicky things that people do, but I, I think one of the things that's really meaningful um, and that you know, I'd like us to get better and better at is, is doing a much better job of really understanding the particular strengths of the person and their motivations and matching them well, placing them well it, 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 you know, in a role um, rather than you know, come in and we'll find a spot for you, but um, it, you know, really, really doing a great job of understanding them and what they're good at and placing them very well in a role. And you know, we, we need to get better at that, um, but I don't see anybody doing that exceptionally well. And I think that's a very meaningful differentiator. Uh, so that's, that's, that's uh, something we're working on. It, it does look like for what, whatever reason, supply of, of this sort of, of talent is, is well below the demand for it. And so then, you know, I, I kind of, I really want to make this a two-part question. I, I want to ask you why you think that is. And also, you're saying, you know, hopefully in the future, we're going to be able to bring those together. And I'd love to know some ideas on how you think that could happen and, and potentially what Amazon is, is trying to do for that longer term to, to help develop that talent. Well, why I think it is, is because it's hard. So if, these, if this work, if this educational curriculum was easy, there wouldn't be a shortage. But it's, it's hard. Um, you know, engineering programs, STEM fields, are academically very rigorous and challenging, and you know, they're, they're difficult. So um, by their very nature, they winnow out a, a lot of people. The answer is, is a lot more complex, because I think it takes a confluence of um, I think it involves um, 
uh, sociological issues. I think it involves education issues. I think it involves just a whole bunch of things that need to be brought to bear to develop this kind of talent. Um, it's, uh, you know, more and more skilled talent is in demand globally. And uh, that's just a fundamental shift in the workforce that's, that's been happening and will, you know, continue to happen. So I think, you know, when I look at public high schools that only offer an AP computer science class and no easy way for others to access it, or when I see the fact that we're not offering computer science types of um, education in primary and middle schools, um, it, it, it's, you know, that's, it's got to start there. It's got to start with our education system. Um, but it's a complex problem and there's many dimensions to it, so there's not a short-term easy answer to it either. I think there's um, many things need to be brought to bear. And in terms of where it's going, um, you know, hopefully, you know, what we're trying to do is work with some of the organizations that I, I think are really trying to impact this, such as um, uh, the Ada Academy and Code.org and um, their Hour of Code and Girls Who Code and NCWIT and um, Anita Borg Institute. So we're, we're trying to partner with and work with organizations that are focused on this problem to, to bring talent um, to the field that has typically not been coming to the field. Um, and I think there are longer term investments in education and, and societal change that needs to be driven to reflect a changing workforce. And that I don't think we're trying to, <laughs> you know, that, that's going to take uh, governmental, education, industry kind of working together. Mm -hmm. Susan, thank you so much for joining me today. My pleasure entirely. I appreciate the invitation. <laughs>